unless there is a, a, a pressing question, we can come back to that later. I know, Henry, your time schedule, but uh, we'll let uh, uh, Amit take over now. Uh, then, as Henry said, that uh, this is a nice segue into Amit's talk in terms of can knowledge graphs help make deep learning systems more interpretable and explainable? So I will uh, ask Amit to take over. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm very lucky I'm following uh, the um, talk by Henry. I think it gave, uh, it, I think what I have to say uh, fits in right, um, uh, you know, just follows what I think uh, the broad um, canvas that he painted. Um, Hopefully, I can get uh, to one level deeper and uh, get onto a little bit of specifics. And also, hopefully, I bring a perspective uh, uh, from more practical things that are happening um, uh, along the significant use of knowledge graphs these days, uh, significant development and use of knowledge graphs, and uh, the actual opportunities for developing concrete solutions. Uh, so, um, you know, it's about knowledge graphs and uh, making deep learning systems more interpretable and explainable. And uh, I have a longer talk, but uh, for the time we have, I will be focusing more on uh, natural language uh, processing and especially understanding. Uh, the similar example can be found in automated vehicles and variety of in sensor data and other uh, cases also. So, um, around in the general area, we, we call a knowledge infused learning. Um, there are a whole number of people working with me and just I wanted to acknowledge them. Um, uh, some of the collaborations in, uh, you know, go beyond just our Institute, AI Institute at South Carolina. Uh, and uh, I just say the kind of, kind of things we do at uh, the AI Institute in the middle, you see, um, uh, core AI problems, and we do a lot of translational research. So on the outside, you see uh, actual collaborations ongoing right now across the campus and, and nation. Um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, you can find more discussion on that in this paper that just came out, or article rather, uh, with the same title, uh, more or less as uh, this this talk. Uh, so wanted to um, you know say that there is something more descriptive about what I'm going to say today. Um, and um, in uh, longer talk, I talk about the knowledge graph and ontologies. Uh, I won't hear because uh, this audience is uh, very much up to date on uh, those issues and I could use the time for some other things. So uh, in, for, for me, the intuition behind uh, why deep learning needs knowledge uh, is that uh, usually, uh, when you want to endow intelligence to machine, it's just simply not possible, in my view, without the knowledge and experience plus reasoning. So, um, while we are focused in the third wave that um, uh, uh, that Henry talked about um, on the uh, on learning uh, from data on the statistical learning, uh, there is just so much um, uh, that there is very concrete need for. Um, uh, the knowledge and uh, experience and reasoning uh, to essentially um, uh, make uh, a system, uh, broadly speaking, intelligent or something that understands and makes uh, um, decisions based on true understanding of the content rather than some uh, pattern or signature or so, so forth. And I see in my mind, um, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I get uh, inspiration from uh, co uh, cognitive science. Uh, they talk about top brain and bottom brain. Uh, from uh, behavioral um, economics, uh, uh, Henry pointed out, uh, Daniel Kahneman and others work on the system one and system two, uh, and perception and cognition. Uh, I see that kind of uh, duality there. And, um, and that uh, the integration of that thing and something that makes this transition possible in our brain, I think we do perception uh, and we also do, you know, uh, deliberative decision making and reasoning. One that really glues the things together, one that connects the two uh, in a more deliberative fashion is that knowledge. So I see a huge uh, uh, value, need and requirement for uh, uh, infusing knowledge in this computational process. That kind of is what drives a bit of good bit of work that we are doing. Uh, it just so happened that uh, we uh, uh, have this article coming out in the uh, 75 year celebration issue for the IEEE 
And, uh, you know, uh, Henry talked about three waves. So we talked about duality of data and knowledge across the uh, three waves of data. Um, and there is an archive version of that. But essentially, you know, we look at layered hybrid systems using neural networks and deep learning for perception with knowledge-based reasoning system for decision making. And you start with the, you know, so you, you see this kind of uh, uh, here a hierarchy of uh, going away from low level to deliberate decisions and actions. And you really, uh, I, I, I see the role of knowledge to be very fundamental. Uh, when, um, uh, even when you have very large amount of, let's say, clinical data, uh, let's say uh, uh, medical imaging, the reason that um, a clinician would not use the system is because you cannot explain how did you come to that uh, decision and that uh, what would be necessary is for the system to be aware of the medical knowledge that is used in the medical guideline that the doctor is, uh, is implementing and has to implement. And so one way or another that has to be brought into the system before uh, you know this uh, very powerful system um, would be useful uh, for uh, decision making, um, um, and um, there are many reasons. In particular, going one level deeper, why knowledge graphs um, um, are very important. Let's say, as I said, I, I kind of focus on uh, NLP, NLU, uh, and uh, in the talk again, there are many reasons, but I will just focus on better contextualization of words and how much context is ne needed to provide a precise uh, response. That general area is what I will focus on, uh, even though a lot more uh, things has to be addressed and work is being done on all of that. So this thing is exciting to me here uh, in that, um, in this case, with the use case of natural language understanding, I see that you know, these days we are, we are all aware of very, very powerful, quote unquote, powerful uh, language models. And, and, and some people have rather uh, unreasonable um, expectation from these language models. And then uh, you are seeing a lot of uh, discussions on the, their limitations. Um, the way I see is that really, uh, if you want to make these systems more useful, uh, you really have to use a whole layer of knowledge. So when we talk about knowledge infusion, it's just not something one concrete, you know, type of knowledge. There is really multiple types of knowledge you really have to think about. So here I portrayed a, a plausible, um, you know, variety of knowledge uh, that would be necessary for uh, deeper understanding of language uh, of text, um, and it would start with the. Uh, language syntactic structure and grammar and some dependency graph tagging and uh, you know POS and dependency graph and complex entity identification to linguistic knowledge uh, like WordNet to common sense knowledge like ConceptNet to uh, broad and general purpose knowledge that uh, uh, we have or we can have access to uh, and to uh, domain specific knowledge and the important thing also to notice is that. Uh, there won't be necessarily only one uh, type of knowledge source at any one layer. For example, at the broad or general purpose knowledge level, in addition to getting something from Wikipedia or DBpedia or Wikidata, I would very much want, in some applications, I may want something like OpenStreetMap and have location related uh, knowledge. Uh, so there can be actually multiple uh, knowledge uh, representations in the in implementation context. Uh, at each level. Similarly, many domain specific uh, knowledge base would be necessary in certain clinical applications. Uh, but this is doable. Uh, and that these are the kind of system that we are building now. I'm going to give you one kind of example. We start with this little paragraph um, in the news uh, article uh, about uh, CDC adding the test for coronavirus. On the left hand side, you see, um, you know, a, um, let's see if I, uh, here is the so uh, you you see here uh, the um, uh, uh, neural parsing with self attention and you're able to find a variety of uh, concepts here on the right hand side you see use of um, um, uh, you know uh, additional use of domain specific knowledge and uh, snowman city and snowman city hierarchy for entities. And you'll be able to identify 
a number of other things. In particular, it's possible that Wikipedia is not yet up to date with uh, coronavirus. And uh, we will find uh, that actually already added to Snowman City and that that itself would also help in getting understanding of some of the concepts. But as you can see here, different type of knowledge uh, can lead to different type of, so these are the things that you got with Wikipedia and these are the things you got additionally with um, Stomer City. And hence, uh, you are in each of them are adding uh, in a different ways to understanding different aspects of the language. Okay. Um, I probably need to, I don't know what is happening with the uh, annotation. Uh, hopefully, this will help. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, so, uh, there are many shortcomings of deep learning. Uh, there are many articles on this, um, uh, and this particularly the black boxness where uh, you're not able to interpret and explain um, uh, has many aspects, components, and reasons for that. Again, uh, there are uh, three uh, items that I hope to uh, talk about a little bit more in, in this, ta in this uh, talk. Oops. Um, so this rotation, I know, made it work out very well. Um, we'll, we'll deal with, let's see. I should have practiced the notation part. What's happening? Um, I mean, oh, in, in, these annotations are not going away, but I found oh, okay. it. Okay. So, uh, so um, now when you uh, apply statistical uh, learning, what happens is that you may get, um, um, uh, you know, uh, these kind of clusters on the left hand side. But um, what you see is on the right hand side, um, uh, relationships are at the heart of semantics that are very critical and that uh, you can get a much better level of understanding um, by adding the relationships. So what you see on the right hand side is that uh, you can enhance what you are getting uh, through this clustering of, let's say, morphine cluster to all the things inside it by applying the subtle knowledge that is already there in the knowledge graph. And that can also add to the in, uh, interpretivity uh, directly. Um, okay. Now, the, uh, the other interesting thing is that there are a lot of uh, biases, um, uh, you know, uh, for these black box approaches. Um, some of them, for example, historical bias that so few percent of the CEOs have been women that um, you may get an idea that the CEO must be a man or uh, in the image net only, um, you know, one person of the images come from China. Again, you'll get a lot of bias and so on and so forth. This is something we understand very well. Well, uh, I think the knowledge graphs can be a very important uh, uh, way to uh, identify these biases and to complement the limitations thereof. So let's look at a, a relatively trivial case of question answering. Uh, you know, uh, here is a, you know, the context is I sometimes wonder how many our colleagues are relapsing under lockdown. And then is a question, does the person have a uh, addiction, a sequence to sequence model, um, you know, would uh, say yes, because that there is overwhelming, um, um, evidence it has in terms of uh, co-occurrences uh, that it would think that um, that is the case. But um, if you look at now this uh, sentence, um, uh, and you ask the question, does the person suffer from depression? Uh, the answer you'll get uh, without knowledge uh, would be, you know, would be yes. True answer is no. There is both a negation and a knowledge that manic episode is a characteristic of anxiety and not depression. So the deeper understanding that is of beyond syntax uh, involving mental health domain is what is necessary if you are going to answer this question well. There's uh, you know something we um, you know all everybody I think in this audience understands the uh, reasoning and multi hop reasoning. Again, these are the kind of things that are uh, nearly impossible. Uh, to do uh, without the use of explicit knowledge, uh, symbolic representation, and reasoning that goes with it. Uh, so, um, um, 
there has been many, um, you know, uh, uh, illustri uh, uh, illustrious uh, success stories. Alpha Fold Two is one of them from last year. But what you see is that it actually uses knowledge from Protein Data Bank to explore and exploit the search space in the protein folding. So again, you'll see that knowledge is actually getting very much uh, uh, added to the uh, you know uh, deep learning algorithms. The point here is though uh, to investigate strategies of doing th that in a lot more flexible way. So uh, here it was solving a very specific problem and the uh, data necessary was uh, very much available from the source of protein data bank and other things that they were able to do. In general, though, uh, the knowledge that we need to infuse is more, more, more desperate, more di comes from more diverse sources, and uh, somehow we need to bring all of them get, get that to get that, that together and then apply that. So uh, there's still additional step and knowledge infusion can help with those like why is this the best structure for a particular purpose? You want to explain that. Uh, it will give you variety of uh, protein folding uh, structures, but why is that the case? Uh, does the structure meet desired functional properties? Uh, another use case we are looking at recently was drug design. And uh, in the drug design, uh, there are a lot of generative models that can help you find all kinds of um, plausible uh, molecular structure molecules. But um, in a good, uh, in any drug design, you have to work, think about solubility and um, uh, toxicity profile uh, uh, panels as studies. And the ideal thing would be for us to be able to infuse knowledge to be able to do those toxicity and um, uh, you know uh, solubility related studies as part of the learning process that uh, you know from the data to the decisions. So uh, symbolic knowledge glued with statistical knowledge or infusing, uh, you know, uh, is what we uh, in one particular one strategy that we the strategy that we follow is this knowledge infused learning. And um, basically, knowledge graphs here for us provide scaffolding, scaffolding to punctuate neural computing. Uh, it it allows uh, you know imagine that there is a uh, you know a trellis, and then you are uh, training your vine on the trellis, you are able to structure what's going on, which is highly um, uh, opaque to something that is a lot more meaningful. And you take them through the path that you understand, and then you can interpret the better, interpret it better and explain it better. So again, um, that analogy uh, is in the bottom I mentioned. Um, we have uh, in one of the articles we have outlined uh, a broad variety of um, strategies and and and, uh, and and reviewed what is uh, there in the literature, uh, and we are kind of broadly identify that is a shallow infusion strategies, uh, semi deep infusion strategies, and deep infusion strategies, um, and uh, basically the um, uh, shallow infusion is about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, adding uh, the self aware uh, or uh, knowledge, external knowledge to the input so you can see here on the left hand side you are adding that and typically it is about like creating knowledge graph embedding that's a reasonably well understood thing in the uh, semi deep infusion we talk about we are actually changing or at, 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 you know the uh, the parameters Right, and uh, and here we are doing it at one layer, in the deep learning mechanism. And in the uh, and here is the here is how um, it kind of looks like. So uh, what happens is that um, you're seeing this text here, and then you're seeing the annotations and see them map to the knowledge graph. Right, and that is the one uh, that would um, uh, uh, provide us. The additional capabilities that comes from knowledge infused learning, all those things that we are talking about in interpretability, explainability, and 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 things. So you see here on the there is this little map on the left hand side in the bottom. There is a DSM five knowledge graph, and then there is a uh, matrix uh, that is created um, uh, using Cedo, and that is then what is um, integrated uh, or, or 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 with the um, 
uh, similar metrics that would otherwise be generated in the um, deep learning model. So the so that the parameters are uh, modified uh, because these uh, particular metrics uh, uh, you know brings in the uh, uh, information from this knowledge, and that is what then leads us to uh, you know uh, the additional power that comes from knowledge. So this then becomes um, you know um, more interpretable and, uh, and and also explainable. In the uh, real in, in the deep learning deep infusion method, we are talking about we are looking into uh, stratified knowledge. Uh, because uh, you are, earlier you uh, remember I showed you a whole set of layer of uh, knowledge, different types of knowledge, whether it is that kind of layer of knowledge or the knowledge of uh, abstraction. One of the uh, you know area that I'm deeply interested in is um, this trifecta of um, contextualization, personalization, and abstraction. And there was recently a uh, you know uh, I think archive paper by uh, Mitchell uh, on 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 abstraction, and uh, this is something that humans do very very well. And uh, one of, one way at a very high level you can say when you go from system one to system two is that you are transcending the levels of abstraction and you go into the higher level of abstraction. We need to endow uh, the deep learning uh, techniques uh, strategies with uh, this uh, whole idea of abstraction. And for that, we are seeing this stratified knowledge as a, ve uh, um, as a uh, vehicle. And then you are, uh, we are looking into uh, integrating knowledge at different layers. Uh, but um, the challenge is, uh, you know, that there are, of course, technical challenges and the challenges are really finding um, uh, not only being able to, uh, you know, attenuate or modify the, uh, the layers, but uh, find the knowledge that uh, uh, at the level of abstraction that um, really fits the uh, kind of uh, processing that is done at that particular layer of the deep learning. Right? So I, you, you get a sense that basically what you are looking at is that here's a layer of, uh, you know, uh, in deep learning and here is a stratified represent of knowledge. <coughs> and at least every layer knowledge is used to um, modify uh, the computation. So that can lead to, in my view, very, very powerful <coughs> strategy. And I really want to go towards supporting abstraction in the uh, uh, in, in this knowledge infused learning framework. <coughs> in the uh, shallow infusion, uh, you want to be able to uh, <coughs> um, explain and uh, I think I'm going to pass that uh, thing. So what you can do is when you are able to identify flu, uh, pneumonia, COVID, you can essentially come to an understanding through external knowledge that these are, there is a concept of affected population and communicable diseases. And just as uh, <coughs> flu and pneumonia can kill people, COVID-19 also kill people, kill people, and then there is additional information that six times more. So um, having the uh, method of having the, uh, this knowledge, uh, now in this particular case, in the shell infusion, the knowledge is coming in by crea you know, creating a vector to match the, um, uh, the, uh, the knowledge embedding space to the uh, data embedding. And in that case, you, your, your <coughs> depth of understanding is still limited, very limited. I'm going to take an example of healthcare. Here are the definition, excuse me, uh, um, <clears throat> a bit of allergies here. That an internal system provides an ability to discern the internal mechanism of any module. Explanation, explanatory system would comprise of collectively uh, <clears throat> exhausting interval subsystems and orchestration among them. When applied to deep learning, text would typically be you know, you'll be able to explain the decision-making process. <clears throat> Domain knowledge in explainability 
uh, you know, it's uh, as you think about it, I would I would play a very significant and very vast knowledge. Don't have time to think about, uh, sorry, talk about all of these uh, stuff, but uh, all of these abilities that knowledge adds. <clears throat> but all of these, um, uh, you know, you can argue basically as you think deeply that infusing the knowledge into the learning process uh, will enable you to have all of the capabilities that I've listed. Uh, that's from the source that is by the way identified there. Let's look at this um, complex, uh, uh, you know, this statement, uh, uh, you know, from a from a Reddit post or something like that. And uh, <clears throat> if the model, uh, you know, you, you ask, is this uh, mental health related, and which mental health condition? Well, um, uh, it will predict depression. That would be wrong. And um, uh, the two answer in this particular case is OCD. And why it is depression, it won't be able to explain. Here, through the infusion strategy, uh, you can make it interpretable, but because you can say what aspect of this learning process contributes to coming up with uh, the solution, uh, the correct solution of OCD. Better yet, uh, you are able to connect uh, the the text uh, and the concepts in the text, entities and concepts in the text, to the concept in the ontology or knowledge graph. And then, what I can uh, you can see you, you you can replace those with those concepts, uh, the the text with the concepts. So here you can see that there was a concept related to obsess uh, obsessive compulsive uh, personality disorder. And then there is a disturbance in thinking. Having now that um, information you, and the knowledge graph that says that um, disturbance in thinking uh, uh, is, is uh, you know, related to OCD and some other aspects that I'm not going to, will lead you to explain why this is obsessive compulsive disorder. There are um, uh, similar statements for similar uh, example from education use case uh, is something uh, we work with a large uh, edutech company. And uh, uh, here, uh, you know, the use case is uh, about explaining why a student is not able to answer on a particular test that there is um, uh, you know, for for projector motion, you need to understand different equation. For that, you need a quadratic equation understanding, uh, uh, and 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 that kind of um, knowledge is necessary to be able to understand the action that a student makes in terms of decision making. So, and there are while we talk about knowledge infused learning, uh, there are a whole bunch of related areas. There is a term used called information learning, uh, and and. Um, and many other uh, things you can see here, where uh, you'll find the concepts related to the kind of things I talked about today. Um, with the, uh, there are a lot of possible uh, uh, use cases or areas that we uh, can make impact in. Uh, we work off, especially here in, we are working on virtual health assistance quite a bit in our institute, and we are also working on self uh, uh, driving car, uh, cars. Uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> Um, and 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 the, uh, in the just other areas that I listed here, um, so there is a huge um, area of um, impact for this class of work. What we are essentially doing is that compared to earlier effort on human labeling effort and um, feature engineering effort, uh, from top right corner to bottom left corner, we are making steady progress by using um, you know by by using knowledge uh, and combining that with symbolic pro uh, with, with, with the with the statistical ai uh, to get this um, knowledge um, enhanced neuro symbolic computing or um, uh, or, um, or knowledge infused learning as you call it there's a, a bunch of paper i think uh, you know um, uh, that that are good examples of the kind of things i talked about that can be explained in the future well, uh, so I think I managed my time very well. Um, 
and um, uh, hopefully there will be questions that we can talk about as usual. Uh, thanks to NSF and NIH for a long uh, series of funding. Okay, thank you, Amit. Uh, that was an excellent follow up for the talk which uh, Henry gave, and uh, you delved on some of the things that uh, Henry also mentioned in his uh, talk. Uh, it looks like uh, the kind of uh, things you have, uh, you, you, are, you are using kind of neural networks in a way to generate the symbols there. And then you put that in the knowledge graph and then there's a lot of feedback. It's kind of very complicated in some sense because you, you also have iteration. Uh, do you do that, like get back to the neural networks again based on what you have learned in the knowledge graphs? Well, I mean, if you want to do interpretation, uh, then uh, you want to be able to explain where in that uh, neural net processing, um, uh, you know, uh, there is a supporting evidence for the answer. So in that sense, uh, you are doing that. Uh, you can in inspect the parts of the uh, processing pipeline uh, or processing that uh, essentially provides the support for the answer that came. Uh, that would be only partial thing, the interpretability, because interpretability is not explainability. And for explanation, you, I gave you a one, uh, you know, a concrete example where I uh, replace in the text by the concepts in the knowledge graph. And the knowledge graph, uh, you are able to reason that in OCD case there are these uh, other things, and hence it is not a depression, but it is OCD. So this kind of, um, you know, uh, part requires, um, I think, a, a combination of things coming from both um, you know you know statistical processing and um, uh, symbolic processing and so that you, together is what gets gives us the power uh, you know, that that, uh, Amit, can you give some metrics in terms of how big are these knowledge graphs neural networks and so on like what does what does it mean for someone who's trying to implement this uh, what what did, what should they be ready for and what how are, this? so so what are they ready for let me see uh, here um, so first of all, uh, as you, uh, as we all know, um, and I didn't talk about uh, the knowledge graphs today. Uh, hopefully, this, so so um, just to quickly see, there are um, you know many many uh, stories on knowledge graph. This is my use of knowledge graph in the patent, uh, which was the first knowledge graph uh, or, or ontology based uh, semantic search. Um, uh, Twelve thirteen years before Google uh, came out with its. Uh, um, um, you know, big semantic search. Uh, and there are so many knowledge graphs here. This is just a, a sort of partial list of knowledge graph. Here are the general purpose knowledge graph. Here are the health specific knowledge graphs. For example, uh, you know, we have built a, uh, an ontology called drug abuse ontology. Um, uh, and um, uh, that is a deep understanding uh, of uh, all the concepts involved in uh, addiction. And uh, those kind of, uh, there are, of course, um, you know, enterprises are using knowledge graph. So all of these companies that are listed, they have their own knowledge graphs. Uh, I showed you this uh, educational company. They have built a very, very large, uh, the largest knowledge graph um, in the um, uh, education space. And there's another company I co-founded called EasyDI. Uh, you can see the, you know, large knowledge graph they have built on, on that side. Okay, this is the knowledge graph for education company. So basically what we have is knowledge graphs of all different kinds and variety. And what you are trying to do is uh, this broad model that I uh, outlined here. Uh, this, this, these are the, uh, you know, uh, templates in a way, the models of how um, we are taking the knowledge and uh, adding that to the, um, 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 uh, you know, and, and other people had also recognized this potential. So um, 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 there are a number of people who have created a knowledge graph uh, uh, based embedding or knowledge graph embeddings. And you essentially, uh, uh, so now you reduce your knowledge graph to a vector space, and then you are basically combining that with the uh, vectors that are there in the deep learning algorithm anyway. In any, any particular sequence to sequence model, you will have a uh, you know data uh, vector space you create from data and you're basically uh, you know combining the two so that is the simplest form that people did the problem with that simplest form is that now yes you are able to attend attenuate or, or modify certain weights in the um, uh, vector that you create from data by incorporating what is learned from knowledge in the limited form of knowledge graph embedding 
what you don't have are richness of knowledge graph. You don't have the relationship retained, for example. So um, um, uh, you, it is important uh, in this other strategies allow you to go back to in the uh, in this example uh, that I gave in this uh, particular slide. You see what is happening here is that we know that uh, this concept here maps to this uh, node in the knowledge graph. So for example, uh, we are uh, one of our use cases understand is radicalization in social media. And there uh, we wanted to understand the radicalization process through the eye of an empirical model that a political scientist developed. Uh, and his empirical model was that there are three factors in radicalization in social media, the uh, religion, the ideology and hate or violence. So we wanted to look, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the uh, text from all of the, the lens of religion, uh, while, uh, uh, you know, ideology and the hate and uh, violence. So for religion, for example, we created a knowledge graph from uh, Hadith. Uh, so we, we, we can study this for Islamic terrorism. We can study this for um, white, extremism, white extremism. And uh, we created, in the case of Islamic um, radicalization, knowledge graph from Hadith and um, uh, Quran, which are the religious texts. And there, um, there are two different, if you do look at the knowledge graph, you'll find that there are two nodes for uh, Jihad. This is Jihad, the, as is using Quran for peaceful purpose, for a positive purpose, and a Jihad that is used by extremists for, um, you know, uh, uh, negative purpose. So when we do the mapping here, you see this Jihad, the jihad, there are three, uh, there are multiple jihad in this text, but they are being mapped to different nodes. This uh, one jihad is mapped to this node here, and these two jihad are mapped to this node. So this is contextually understanding. You see the, the top two jihad, uh, uh, let me portray the slide here, uh, you can see it more easily. See the top two jihad here, they map here. This is the negative use of jihad. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is the uh, positive use of, and then there is a negative use of jihad. This is, uh, you know, uh, uh, killing and other things like that. So, um, um, uh, so, 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 uh, sorry, there, there can be two different one. I don't know, maybe this picture doesn't show you that. But the two jihad will have different nodes uh, based on the different use of jihad. And then you are able to explain that jihad is used in different ways in different, um, uh, you know, in different texts. And now you can explain, well, you know, this is a wrong use of jihad and it's used for radicalization, while this is other positive use of jihad that is not used for radicalization. Okay. But uh, essentially, now you have power of both aspects. I think we all understand, um, uh, even in Henry's talk, you know, the, you know, the clear examples of what you can do with uh, uh, um, symbolic, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, AI and uh, uh, logic. Uh, that now we can do both, uh, you know, uh, in our uh, knowledge infused learning process. Yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, for that answer. That was uh, kind of that was clear. And uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. Ravi, you had something on the chat. And also, uh, Amit, uh, if you can send the slides to us, that will be great uh, sure. to for, for it to be posted. So you can send it to Ken Baklaski as sure. a slide set. Okay. Sure. Uh, okay. uh, let me see if there's anything on the uh, chat. Uh, oh, thank the, you. No. The two chats. I, that, uh, the, uh, there is another chat page which is uh, which <coughs> another link which says some soapup.org slash conferring. Yeah, they are showing it here, I guess. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's <coughs> Amit, I have a question. Uh, you partially answered one of my questions, mm -hmm. which was um, you have generally entities and relationships in a knowledge graph, but by adding embeddings, you enrich the, that knowledge graph to include concepts that you just now showed the examples of. But are there, are there, therefore you are really processing the embeddings or are you still tying yourself to um, entities and relationships that led you to those embeddings so that you don't lose out the 
atomic level of entities and the aggregate level of what you call the embeddings so in general uh, if you if your computational system is all built around some vector and uh, multidimensional space portrayed by the vector um, there is very little in that to provide something that is human understandable so the uh, value of the strategy that i showed uh, such as when you are doing um, um, let's see uh, uh, when you are uh, doing this sort of thing um, uh, as you see on the slide here that you are uh, able to link the text to the concepts that are in the knowledge graph now you have the what what it takes to do explanation so uh, we are trying we are we are building the systems where um, uh, we will come up with an explanation in a human readable form yeah or uh, or show it as a graph uh, and a yeah. uh, point here is that here is a text that we, that originally existed but by look you look at the items in in blue those are the concepts in those are the replacement of the text by concepts in the knowledge graph and then you can argue from that that this is uh, you know uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder because it uh, talks about these and these or because there is a negation between this concept and not that concept and so um, you know we can write on the uh, sort of take the ideas from abstract summarization and then build uh, you know a summary uh, argument or explanation for what is understood from the text uh, that then now human can understand so on one hand you have the result such as yes this is a more correct result like in this particular example the correct result is that OCD. The prediction here you see is OCD. Uh, uh, and so you can actually, uh, if you did not use knowledge, uh, I showed you that uh, very, very likely the, uh, the basic, uh, you know, models, uh, language models would have given you that the answer is depression, not OCD, and that would be wrong. <coughs> so um, uh, it, both you are improving the uh, answers, that's one part, but you are able to explain it because now you, know what are the concepts uh, there's a medical knowledge that you have from which you can build uh, the explanation medical knowledge says that you know in this context observes you know um, it is uh, ocd in this other context it is not ocd very good very good example you have shown because you have gone from a condition of let's say mental health to explaining it including it in a text form or in the embedded uh, symbols form. Yes. Thank you. But now, last question is on differentiation between knowledge, understanding, and uh, learning. Differentiation between knowledge, yeah, uh, understanding. understanding, and learning. I mean, uh, just kind of clarify, clarify on that. What he wants to know is that uh, you have created these knowledge graphs. So the knowledge graphs are just the semantic graphs which are. Which, which exists out there. But in terms of, and two things he wants to know is that, what does it mean? Like, how do you understand what it means? Okay. Like if someone has an OCD kind of thing that you have, what does it mean by someone having an OCD? Okay. So what is the implications of, the, of, 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 of uh, this particular symbol structure? And the other thing is that to do, do with learning. So with these knowledge graphs and with this uh, constant consultation, are you going to generate new concepts here that we generated into the, Knowledge graph. Uh, Ravi, is that what I summarize, summa, summarizing your uh, statement? Pretty good. Yeah. Whether it is in relation to knowledge graph or otherwise, either would be helpful. Yeah. Let thank make, thank you, Ram. Yeah. Thank Let you. me make some uh, uh, further uh, state uh, clarification and, and, and details. When we are talking about knowledge graph, uh, yes, knowledge graphs is this uh, representation, entities, and relationships. But um, um, and it can be even back of words. So first of all, we all know that uh, knowledge representation comes in a very wide variety from nomenclatures and taxonomies and, uh, uh, you know, and then we know the uh, representational richness of uh, 
uh, property graph versus uh, RDF versus OWL. All this is something uh, we are aware of, and I didn't want to go into those details there. But I do want to clarify that the moment uh, we are using knowledge graph, I'm not just showing using knowledge graph to create embedding and get done with it. I have that knowledge graph and I have the reasoning system. Just like in any symbolic AI system, I am able to reason uh, that um, a PTSD is a special case of anxiety with overlapping systems. And that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, here is the question, how come DL sum summarizer records that uh, a patient has been diagnosed with PTSD when the script says otherwise? And here, you know, you're using the knowledge and you're doing additional reasoning. So what I mean here is that we are the, in a very simplest form. You can um, take the knowledge from the knowledge graph, create a, uh, uh, a, a you know a representation that is compatible with what the deep learning system does in AI system the 300, you know, uh, vector of size 300, and um, and um, and be done with it and that does improve the learning in the for the learning as you call learning in the deep learning that you know and which then leads that learning leads to that prediction for example so you that is one part which is a very limited view of what you can do but you have all the other power that you do when you are doing with the reasoning i mean um uh, the simple you know analogy is that uh, I would guess that in humans, we have the system one and we do perception. And then we have the system two, we do, uh, you know, cognition, we do uh, analogies, we do reasoning. The, um, the same way that is what human brain does, the knowledge infused system that I'm interested in developing does also the same, that thing, in that when necessary, I'm going to the higher level of abstractions and doing the reasoning to give you the explanation in the form that humans can understand why the system worked the way it did or how you should interpret the result from the system uh, or what, what does it, you know, why the system came up with what it came up with. And that work is done at a system two level kind of thing. And that is, I, I'm, I'm mimicking that by using my, uh, you know, um, uh, symbolic AI uh, research uh, in paradigm and tools and whatever we have. Right? So I can do abductive reasoning, I can do um, uh, inductive reasoning, uh, you know, so, so, so I can do all forms of reasoning that I have to do what I need to do for the things. And the system that we are talking about here is the one that does both. Uh, remember, in all these things, we just did not say, recognize that deep learning system has done amazing job in processing massive amount of data and get something out of it. So that benefit still remains i you know we are still talking about using uh, the deep learning uh, we are talking about modifying the deep learning and connecting in different ways and what i'm saying what what we also portrayed here is that uh, this connection comes in simple form with limited uh, uh, benefit and a more um, a challenge a more uh, uh, integrated form so one is interoper interoperably versus integration so the uh, this comes with a simpler form like in shallow infusion and a deeper, highly integrated form uh, with support for uh, abstractions in the deep uh, uh, learning. And there's something called uh, semi-deep learning. Uh, these are again very broad categories. Within them, there are subcategories, just the same way Henry portrayed, you know, these six different um, uh, neuro and symbolic, uh, 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 you know, um, mashes. Uh, similarly, uh, these come in all the different varieties and we are we are creating the, these varieties in the broad classification of shallow semi-deep and deep infusion and in in the as you go from uh, uh, if when you talk about semi uh, uh, shallow infusion we are limiting ourselves to uh, 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 you know essentially remaining in the traditional statistical ai space with uh, some small improvement uh, by use of knowledge and so we are basically, uh, our ability is slightly improved for interpretability and almost nothing for explainability when we do that um, uh, 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 shallow infusion strategy. But when we go towards deep infusion strategy, 
um, uh, then we are uh, really not talking about uh, deep learning or statistic AI alone. We are talking about a combination and an integrate or hybrid or integrated form of statistical and symbolic AI. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think we're running out of time and- uh, I think uh, Sudharam, Sudharam yeah. has a question. Uh, yeah. Hi, can I can I ask a quick question? Thank you. Um, no. I type. Do you, do we have just a couple of minutes? Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you, Amit and Henry. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. I had a question about, uh, you know, how this neurosymbolic approach or embedding knowledge graphs can act. I can see that it helps with abstractions. Uh, because the knowledge graph has abstractions in it, right? Lower level concepts and, you know, super classes and so on and relationships. But what about analogies? Uh, you know, the, the, basically the human thinking, one big part of us being able to reason is using analogies. Uh, how does this neurosymbolic approach or even incorporating knowledge graphs kind of tackle this problem of analogies? Very, uh, I'm so glad you asked this question. This uh, we have actually a project on uh, uh, automatically uh, identifying analogies uh, using uh, the knowledge infused learning. So this actually happens to be an active area of research. Uh, we are working with educators, in particularly uh, instructors uh, in uh, that are that teach undergraduate biology and uh, 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 biochemistry courses. And so uh, there is a uh, a colleague, uh, somebody I know, collaborator we have who has uh, uh, over the years um, uh, used analogy in his classroom and had students uh, develop analogies. Uh, so you can describe a biochemical process through a sports analogy or analogy of uh, firefighters going to drowse mm -hmm. a fire. Uh, and these analogies, uh, there's a large, you know, they, they just build a decent corpus of these analogies. And we have been working on um, essentially uh, creating mechanisms to uh, 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 first um, uh, develop a system to, and there's a, you know, actually pending NSF proposal, um, uh, to, uh, uh, and to, to help teachers uh, decide whether the analogies are good or how good or partially good and how good and what aspects of the a learning material is captured in analogy and what is missing. And then later on, we uh, we plan to go towards uh, actually um, uh, creating analogies, uh, you know, uh, in the, so it's just like we have transfer learning, we are talking about a transfer learning applied to analogical, uh, you know, analogies. And that's a very exciting uh, area. And uh, uh, if you're interested, we'll let's, let's uh, you know, talk about it offline. I'll be happy to share. Yeah, it. I'd love to do that. Yeah, thank you. Because I think this is a particularly challenging problem in AI reasoning. And, you know, if you read about what Andrew Karpathy says, he says we're really far, far away from this kind of reasoning. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it, it is a very complex problem. Yeah, it is one of the more difficult ones that uh, we, are, uh, we are working on. Pretty, pretty challenging, yes, indeed. But... Uh, I am hopeful that given that I have knowledge graph for chemistry and biochemistry and biology, and given that I have knowledge graph um, or DBpedia for this other domain, that I, you know, just the same way I showed you the, this particular graph, uh, you know, here where things get annotated with different, um, you know, ontology, uh, a very simple answer is uh, um, that we'll take um, uh, uh, text one, and the analogical text two, for the text one with the relevant uh, domain model, we will uh, understand uh, instantiation of concepts. Text two with the rele relevant domain model, which could be sports or, uh, ontology, understand uh, concepts there, and then look at the structures, the subgraph structures of the two. And the analogy is partially, not fully, supported by having similar uh, structures and you know here is the lead concept here's the lead concept and that around that um, there is this scaffolding and there is similar scaffolding on the other side and that is how you can get uh, uh, so that's the intuition okay again uh, thanks a lot thank uh, you uh, uh, amit because we are a little bit running out of time i know if you had time you would have given answered uh, 
uh, Ravi's other question of mindfulness, uh, how can you convert your symbolic knowledge structures like mantras into mindfulness? But that's a topic of another discussion. For, right. <laughs> talk. So anyway, thanks again. And uh, we appreciate both Henry and uh, Amit for taking their time and giving excellent talks. And thank you again for the audience for asking those insightful questions. Uh, so until next time, uh, we, the next neuro symbolic uh, uh, session is, I guess, May 5th, uh, where uh, we have, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess uh, we have two speakers uh, at a time. Uh, one, I believe, is from IBM, another from NIST. So you can look into the website and, and see. And, uh, and you can see again all the, those people talking. Uh, we'll have links to the talks we had today. So, with that, uh, Ken, I'm, go I'm going to uh, hand over the session to you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and uh, next week, um, Leah Dickerson will be speaking. Um, so, please come. It's um, title is Integrating Sustainability into Ontology Development, the Case of GAO's Fraud Ontology. Hmm. So next week, same time, um, please join us. And thank you all. Okay. Again, I mean, thank this you. is recorded and it will be on the website. Great. Looking forward to that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.